Who's going to introduce whom first? <laughs> I will introduce you, and then you can introduce me, if you like. Um, so Fine. Michael Bywater is a columnist, culture critic, teacher of tragedy, of creativity, and of analytic investigation. True. A musician, including a fabulous organist, and a lot of other stuff as well. He, and a snappy dresser. He Bless you. He is the author, among other things, of Big Babies, The Chronicles of Bajpol, and Lost Worlds, which was BBC Book of the Week, read by Stephen Fry, on Radio 4. Uh, and his first musical instrument, well, the first musical instrument he ever touched was a sitar, aged five. Uh, Michael was five, not the sitar. <laughs> <coughs> Catherine, <laughs> I have a whole, a whole publication here, so I will read this chapter at a time. Now, Catherine, um, who's an old friend, Catherine Scoble is historian of music in Mughal India. Uh, through stories about ill-fated courtesans over winning maestros, captivated patrons. She writes about sovereignty, about selfhood, friendship and desire, sympathy and loss and power, worldly and indeed strange. Her latest book with Inka Varajmani and Margaret Pernau is Monsoon Feelings. I pause before the subtitle because it's, the, it's absolutely wonderful. Monsoon Feelings. You'll want to buy it just for the subtitle in it. A History of Emotions in the Rain speaks to certainly the British soul. There's, there's the book, so it will, you'll recognise it. It's and it has July. a curiosity. It's out in July, and it has a curiosity which again makes it worth buying only for this. There is a tampura here which is not being held or supported by anyone. You thought that was a simple good resonator. No, it is actually an anti-gravity device, and this has been revealed for the first time on the cover of this book. There is Monsoon Feelings, A History of Emotion in the Rain. Okay. For a moment, it grew. Tentative hearts unfolding in the fleeting heat of a fugitive sun. Plucked, pasted, pressed between leaves, no longer growing, but a specimen to be catalogued, a sacrifice in search of beauty, anatomy of a faded rose. For a moment, it flew, delicate wings vibrating in the tender breath of a summer night, prisoned, pinioned, pinned on a board, no longer flying, but a species to be classified, a sacrifice in search of science anatomy of a crumbling moth. For a moment, we knew. Wondrous minds discovering in a single note unfathomable truth. Caught, captioned, words on a page, no longer knowing, but a discourse to be analyzed, a sacrifice in search of distance, anatomy of a moment, gone. In 1691, Mughal biographer Sheikh Khan Lodi wrote that it is impossible to capture the essence of music in pen and ink on the surface of a page. This is true of all music. Writing about music is famously like dancing about architecture. <laughs> but the North Indian classical tradition to which he was referring is, in addition, not based on pieces fixed and written down on paper like European music. It's more like jazz. In the performance of an Indian rag, more of which in a moment, music's only ever brought into being in the moment of its sounding, improvised by the creative artist into response to that particular audience. Once the last note has died away, the music is lost forever, taking the visceral, emotional, human experience, experience of being there, listening with it into silence. Leaving behind what exactly? can't actually see the slide, so I'm just going to check that, yes, an extremely boring slide. Um, what residue remains of the moment of musical experience when everything else has gone? And why have so many writers down the ages tried so very hard to recapture those lost moments on paper when we know it can't be done? Since the late 19th century, we have been able to rehear the musical moment through the means of increasingly sophisticated audio and visual recording technology. The problem is thus most acute for music before the era of recorded sound. For India, the sound of the great raga performances of the distant past are forever lost. 
Not only that, there are entire ragas that now lie beyond recall, obsolete before the 20th century, when we might have had a chance to record them. And tens of thousands of songs lie silent on the page with few clues as to how they were once sung. But in fact, the new technology plays us false. The sound recording doesn't tell us what it felt like to be there then, only what it feels like to be here listening to it now, split apart from the person who made the sound and the place it was made in. It doesn't tell us anything of what that music meant to the people who made and listened to it, which to me is everything that makes music compelling. It is here, oddly, that writing on music comes into its own, especially before the era of recorded sound. North Indian writers in the Mughal period, the 16th through 19th centuries, knew that it was impossible to capture music and writing. And yet they wrote about raga copiously again and again and again from many different angles. What I think Mughal writers on music were really straining to recapture was not so much the sound of the ragas, though they tried to do that too, but the world of insight and intense emotion wrapped up in the human experience of listening. What happens then when we try to use some of those writings to bring a lost raga, beloved at the 18th century Mughal court, back into the land of the living? The lost raga I'm going to talk about, which should be there, yes, is rag gaunt. A rag associated with the monsoon season in India, which appears to have been the favourite rag of the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II, who reigned from 1759 to 1806. But first, for those of you who don't know, I should probably explain what a raga is, because uh, it's quite a different concept from a scale. So, do, re, mi, fa, so, so, la, ti, do, do, ti, la, fa, so, ma, mi, re, do. It's always difficult switching from speaking to singing, so that was pretty crap. Um, Fortunately for everybody in this room, I can't actually sing properly um, in Hindustani tradition, um, so I won't be bringing the rains down upon us. Uh, um, so instead of being a scale, a raga is something else, and I'm going to use a close relative um, of raga gond, gond malhar, to demonstrate. And a note for those of you in the audience who are aficionados, apart from apology for my terrible singing, um, Gond was definitely different and separate from Gond Malhar in the 18th century. Okay. So a rag has two avatars. Sonically, it is a melodic formula or skeleton that provides a blueprint for composition. Each rag is made up of a set of sound marks that identify it uniquely as that rag. So Gond Malhar makes use of sound marks that are common to monsoon or Malhar rags. So the use of, the, of raised knee in ascent and lowered knee in descent. So we have, we have, sa re ga ma pa da ni sa ni, ni sa ni. So it uses both of those. And it also uses these, um, ma re re pa ni pa, which are common to a number of malha rags. But it adds a little bit of extra to them to get its own specific flavor. Gama re pa, dani pa. And so we end up with a shape something like this. Sa re gama re pa, ma pa dani pa, ma pa dani sa, sa dani pa, ma gama re sa. But a raga is much more than just sound. It also takes a visual or imagined form as a hero, heroine, or deity that embodies a specific emotional mood with supernatural force, awakened by the musician's expert handling of those sound marks. Monsoon rugs all embody slightly different moods of longing and fulfillment brought on by the monsoon. And they also, in theory, possess the supernatural power to bring on the drought-quenching rains. Unfortunately, ragond has been obsolete in North Indian classical music since the turn of the 20th century. We are not necromancers, and we can't bring the sound of ragond back from the dead. But what we can identify through late Mughal musical notations, painting, and poetry is Gorn's specific emotional flavor and the effect it had on Mughal listeners, and one listener and song composer in particular, 
the Emperor Shah Alam II. At its height, the Mughal Emperor Empire covered almost the whole of the South Asian subcontinent. But by the late 18th century, the empire was reduced to the outskirts of Delhi after a series of invasions, wars, and the encroachment of the British East India Company. The life and reign of Shah Alam II was full of pathos and tragedy, as well as resilience and dignity in the face of his diminishment. In 1788, Shah Alam's power had dissipated to such an extent that he had his eyes gouged out in his own throne room by the Afghan warlord Ghulam Qadir. Thereafter, while he was largely left in quietude for the remainder of his long life, he lived it as a puppet of the Marathas and then, after their seizure of the Mughal capital in 1803, the East India Company. Among other accomplishments, Shah Alam was renowned as a fine poet and composer of songs in the Braj Pasha, Urdu and Persian languages. His best songs were compiled into a large collection in 1797 called the Nararati Shahi, the Emperor's Choicest Compositions. My colleague David Lunn and I first became inspired to find out more about Rag Gond because although it has since been lost, it was clearly Shah Alam's favorite rag, and the most important monsoon rag of the late Mughal period. What then were Rag Gorn's specific emotional qualities and why did it appeal so much to Shah Alam's state of mind? We can use clues from its 18th century melodic structure, Shah Alam's own poetry in Rag Gorn and Ragmala paintings at the time to get a feeling for it. As Shah Alam sang, translated by David Lunn, now a lover, if you should so desire, listen to the melody of Rag Gond. Give voice to the plaintive cries of your heart. Tell, my darling, your emotions in company. The most obvious hints that Gond was a monsoon raga lie in the poetry. But we can also tell from its sonic structure in music treatises, but also Remarkably, the songs of the Nadarati Shahi themselves are listed in groups according to our modern understanding today of the Raga's melodic relationships to each other. Shah Alam was remarkably modern in this respect. And we can come back to this slide later um, if uh, there are any aficionados in the audience who would like the details of Gorn's sonic traces in the music treatises, but suffice it to say that Gond was a major monsoon rag, suspiciously close to today's Mianki Malhar. Associated with earthiness, the counterpart to Rag Meg, whose name means cloud, and thus associated with the rain-laden sky. It is Shah Alam's poetry, though, that nuances our understanding of Gond as a monsoon rag associated with the earth. Shah Alam's songs drench us with rainwater, low dark clouds, thunder, lightning, earthy greenery, and draw out the exquisite monsoon tension of love stretched between longing for and fulfillment of union, of the lover's return at this time of tucking up together in a secluded place. These songs are all in David Lund's translation. The rain and the water, the thunder roars and the clouds gather, now our eyes are longing to drink. The lightning flashes and shakes my very life. My darling, how will you get to your satisfied rest? This is a very clever one. What does it feel like when the rains have come, but your lover still has not come back? The promises of the quill, papian, peafowl have distressed me. Without the eyes of my beloved, the rainy season might as well last six months. Seeing the green earth, the peafowl makes a noise. In every direction, over every house, the lowering clouds swirl and the thunder roars. And here, um, Shah Alam makes use of a very um, clever onomat onomatopoeia to drum home the drumming of the rain on the earth. Gar kar gata ghum rahi uh, Here's another one that specifically refers to Shah Alam's bodily experience of the monsoon and of Ragond. Come on this beautiful, splendid day, today, Wednesday. Take the air and delight in the garden. Emperor Shah Alam, sate your thirst and take pleasure in matters of Rag Gond. Emotionally, then, Rag Gond seems to have represented the imminent moment of joyful union between the clouds and the earth, 
the lover and the beloved. The moment of the most intense anticipation when the lover knows that the promise of her beloved's return is definitely going to be fulfilled, but he has not quite yet come. This is reinforced by paintings of Ragorned in the Garland of Raga or Ragmala tradition. An 18th century copy of this painting describes her thus in Richard Williams' translation, Gaunt is an impassioned, exquisite woman. She holds the thought of her distant lover tenderly in her heart. Sitting with the one source of her love before her, she reads aloud the words inscribed on her heart. Her friends play besi beside her play to her. With sweet notes, they sing of the thrills of happiness. When she hears word of her lover's approach, her body blooms and her bliss thunders. She decks herself in a special colorful dress and watches the road in every direction. Gaunt is an impassioned woman, beautiful in her desire, completely devoted to her Lord. Her soul knows of the approach of her lover, the flower of her body burns. What then was the particular emotional valency of Rag Gaunt for Shah Alam? And why did he set so many of his songs in this rag? Shah Alam's songs in Ragorn do indeed have a specific local cast to their emotional flavor. Many of them refer to the monsoon as it was experienced in the pleasure gardens built explicitly to enjoy the rainy season at the Mughal summer palace at Mehruli, just south of Delhi, with its restful resident Sufi saint, Qutbuddin, contributing his personal temperament of quiet fulfillment to the atmosphere of this secluded time and place. From our perspective, these songs are incredibly poignant, almost painful. For this Mughal emperor's dearest hopes and desires for his life and his country would remain forever in the realm of longing. The great beauty of the green earth pleases and the clouds circle all around. This pauper makes his pilgrimage to beg a boon of Lord Qutbuddin. The peafowl murmur atop the hills while the frogs make noise as they gather. Turn your eyes to the beautiful waterfalls and spread the covering fully over the grave. I beg this of you, Lord Qutbuddin. Fulfill all the desires of my life. I worship you. Please hear me, constantly touching your feet. Give riches and a country to Shah Alam and fill his treasure house, strolling beneath the mango trees, gazing at the spread cloth and the waterfalls. The hope expressed here is deeply sad in retrospect. Ragorn had lost its power to turn Shah Alam's dreams into reality. In 1806, a few months before the emperor died and was laid to rest forever at Miroli, Deputy British resident William Fraser wrote home to his father in Invernessshire. At this time, I was constantly at the side of the king and could not but admire his extreme nobility. The loss of his eyes does not at all disfigure his countenance. But the history of their loss and of his misfortunes exalts to the highest our pity and our veneration. On his death, and not until then, we may say that the line of Timur is extinct as a dynasty, beginning with the lame and ending with the blind. It took a little longer than that, until in 1858 the British sent his grandson, Bahadur Shah Zafar, into incarcerated exile for the term of his natural life. But the promises of the monsoon birds at Mehrali were still empty. Shah Alam's hopes for the restoration of his kingdom were never fulfilled. Michael. Okay, I'm going to go off on a completely different tack <laughs> than I thought I was going to, because listening to this again, it seems to me... Um, we're moving towards an idea almost a kind of provisional poetics of ephemera. Um, and the opposite of ephemera, ephemera themselves are not things that the Western culture is good at dealing with. It comes, it goes, it stops. We don't try to seize the moment. We don't try to peg it down so that we can absolutely watch it, trying to escape, trying to echo it. We're more given to the reversal of the direction, I think, of ephemera. I'll give you three examples, pretty ancient, two of them, moderately ancient, the third. First one um, is a line 
that I used um, in the Prologomenon. You don't get many of those these days, Prologomenons, of this book. And it's by um, Pindar. And it seems to me it's a question which is absolutely central to what we're talking about. Epamarai. Te de tis, te de otis, skias onar anthropos. Should be anthropos, but it's not. Rough translation, it's from Pindar's Pythian Odes, is gone in a day. Who is someone? What's no one? Everyone. It's the shadow of a dream. And it seems to me that our poetry tries more to pin down the shadow than the Indian poetry which tries to pin like a butterfly on a board, the dream. I don't think, and I will try and argue convincingly why I don't think, I don't think there is such a big cultural difference as we like to believe. It is not that something strange is going on here or something strange is going on south of Delhi where uh, Pohlam is, 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 is looking dignified and trying to be sensitive and attend to his emotions and feel the movement of affect in his soul to the accompaniment of, not purely stimulated by, but facilitated by the rag, gone, which he can't hear because it doesn't exist anymore. It's more simple than that. It's looking, I think, at something our music does too, and particularly our poetry and our writing does too. Another poem. Ephemerality turned backwards. This is a lover. Propertius, uh, I suppose you probably know. Sunt aliquid manes. Letum non omnia fuid loridasque victos fogid umbra rogos. It's saying, and it's one of the most horrible poems ever written, I think. It's ghastly. It's saying, well, there are some kind of ghost. It starts in the middle of a conversation. Well, there are some kind of a ghost. Son aliquid manes. Some sort of, something's going on. Letum non omnia Death does not put a stop to everything. I remember one night, and his lover's come back. She's half charred. He hears the clack of her finger bones from her burned fingers. She pleads with him. Why did he not help, help push her funerary pyre cart to the side of the road? She is there. You said I was the most beautiful. You said I was the best. But when it came to it, you've gone. And all those moments, all those embraces, all those kisses, all those songs, all those dances, all that everything doesn't matter because here I am, not even burnt, half burnt. Horrible, a truly horrible poem, but trying to do the same thing. What is love and how does it fail? The Roman poets seemed more to believe that it failed because one or both of the parties in the love affair failed. Um, the tradition you're working in seems to be more stoical, if you like. Love fails because love fails. And we'll find, you know, yes, we'll have should and me. If it, if it helps to bring us to terms with this. Or uh, ragas are always there. If it's dark at night and the girl knows the lover's coming, but he's not here yet, but my goodness, he will be here. Um, you know, there'll be some, some guy tuning up a sitter and wondering if he can remember how to set it to Bhagashri, because that's the right one for determined expectation of unity with the lover in the middle of the night at two in the morning. Can we have that slide with, 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 um, with the old chap again? There we are. The wonderful thing about this, I find it absolutely fascinating, and it's on several of, if not all, of the depictions of him, is the great dignity and a sort of calm resignation. And, all these different painters paint the same. It's not an icon, because it's all different. He's always pointing in a different direction, or his hat is different. But there he is. He is, I think, reflecting. He's got his 
inputs. He can smell, he can feel the weather, he can feel the rain if it's the monsoon time. He's got his beads, each one of which will feel different. And he's reflecting on his life, a long, strange, difficult life. Can we have the peacock girls again? Girl, lady. Peacock lady. Peacock lady. The peacock is a symbol of it doesn't need really much talking about, does it? Um, there they are, the two snaky ones. Did you notice his, in the previous slide, his peacocks, two flying above, two rather sneakily coming in beneath, almost beneath the parapet? She is, what's she doing? If he was reflecting, if he was finding his memories, if he was taking comfort in the persistence of the, the past in his own mind, what's she doing? She's not quite on the hilltop in the, the dark with the chap playing by Sri, but she's looking ahead. She's anticipating. She hasn't got the whole picture, but she thinks she knows how it's going to turn out. Those are the two poles, anticipation and recollection, that seem to me in both cases, in both this poetry and this poetry backed by the ragas, and in the Western European tradition, of, um, of poetry. They're the two elements, reflection and anticipation, that lie at the root of probably all of literature, whether you include music in literature or you, you don't. And those are metonymy and metaphor. Try and say the one is metonymy, the other is metaphor. You change your mind instantly. I know recollection is metonymy, the substitution of a part for the whole, of a place for the person there. We talk about number 10. If anyone doesn't know this thing, it's not properly taught. Number 10. Well, it's not number 10 saying anything. It's actually a spokesman. We say, can you pass the milk, when we mean can you pass the jug with the milk in. Metonymy is proximity. Metaphor, similarity. But that tension between recollection of the thing that has gone, the ephemera that have gone, and what is to come, seemed to me to be almost a Greek balance, I think, uh, in, in this. Um, now, this is completely off what I was going to say. What I was going to do was talk a little bit about this book. Um, I had no idea what was going to start here, and it still goes on. Um, starting. The idea originally came from um, Mary Beard, who'd been given it and thought it, it lacked structure and form, and therefore I should have it. <laughs> so, so I did it. Um, but I would think I was looking at it last night, and it seemed to me that one of the things that I think Hylan would have recognised instantly, though completely different in tradition, a hundred and whatever years before he was born, 5,000 miles away, on the banks of the Thames, um, John Donne, and in particular John Donne's poem, uh, one of the strangest of his many very strange poems, um, The Nocturnal Upon St Lucy's Day. Already we are on a Wednesday, we are in a season, we are at a time of day, we're at a particular place. We're in the middle of winter, the longest day, it's 27th, not the 21st of December because the calendar changed, but it's still the same day. And he is setting something that you would recognize there. He is describing things which are lost against um, the sensibility of a real earth, a real world, a real society. With real... He's locked into the natural world just as much as those lovers are. It has calendars, it has events, the stars are in their courses. The seasons change, desire is impermanent and will fail, immortal love is something to be longed for. Its sweep, its, its affect, which Dunn achieves through exercising intellect, not the disposition of the heart or the droop of the neck, is profoundly melancholic. He starts with a simple statement of time of day. "'Tis the year's midnight and it is the day's." He makes a model of the world of correspondences where his love, its death, his survival, the desiccated earth, all, all subject us to a kind of vegetable death. The sun is spent and now his flasks send forth light squibs, no constant rays. The world's whole sap is sunk. He's a man who's known pain. 
caused a scandal by marrying a woman for love, and he carved the words John Dunn, Anne Dunn, undone, on the chimney piece of their honeymoon cottage later their house, because it blocked many routes to preferment. And it also is a nice little dirty joke for a honeymoon. Undone can mean <laughs> two things. This poem, The Nocturnal, comes after he had heard incorrectly that his lost love had died. Um, it might have been his beloved friend, Lucy Carrington, uh, Countess of Bedford. They were great friends and the well-wishers always insisted they were lovers. It might have been his daughter, it might have been his wife, but in this parched world it doesn't matter. Because, and I think this again is, it's absolutely the same culture come out from a different angle. He says, the general balm the hydroptic earth hath drunk wither as to the bed's feet life is shrunk, dead and interred. Yet all these seem to laugh. Laugh? No. Seem to laugh compared with me who am their epitaph. To be the epitaph of death is a fine claim, but he has more. He wants to become a Shah Alam, became in his own tomb at Delhi a saint. A story to admonish the young, the lovers in waiting, as he warns them in a virtuoso sort of alchemical cadenza. Study me, then, you who shall lovers be at the next world, that is, at the next spring, for I am every dead thing in whom love wrought new alchemy. For his art did express a quintessence, even from nothingness, from dull privations, lean emptiness. He ruined me, and I am re-begot of absence, darkness, death, Things which are not. Things which are not are what we're thinking about. Things which seem to be and go again. The book itself here was largely written in the aftermath of, of uh, a very close friend, a man I loved as much as anyone has ever loved a man, uh, Douglas Adams. We spent at least an hour, two, three, on the telephone with each other every day, and then suddenly he died. And I just carried on. And it was only at the end of this book that I realised that it was... A grief at an evanescence. Um, and it was, there was something going through my mind throughout the whole process. This is several hundred small essays on things. And it was a quote in a book that uh, uh, Douglas and Mark Carwardine had written about the ephemerality of the natural world, Last Chance to See, an extraordinary book on impending extinctions. Um, He had written about a man returning to his rural village somewhere in the southern hemisphere, because it always is. It can't be Cornwall. Um, and he finds himself cut off from his friends and family, and he tries to show them interesting things like his fancy shoes and his expensive biro and his sunglasses and all this, and it, it doesn't really count for anything. And Douglas wrote, the gifts he has turn to dust in his hands as he realises that everything he has is merely the shadow cast by what he has lost. And I wrote, this was about Douglas, but he was for once wrong. The gifts of life do not turn to dust, nor does loss cast a shadow. Loss sheds its light on what remains, and in that light, all that we have, and all that we have had, glows more brightly still. Mm. Which was a sort of apotheosis for a dead friend, but more to the point, I think, takes some of the sting out of the ephemerality of life. Our job, think how many things where you, 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 you were talking about, the, uh, and uh, Peter Sackville West, that quote about uh, casting the, the butterfly net over the moment, about um, trapping things, pinning things, about how we try to... We can't. And that certainty must surely affect our understanding of ephemerality. Um, we can talk about it forever. Um, but I think I might as well, I think I might stop there. Ephemerality in the music, because once gone, it's gone forever. In the words, because words try to trap it. In paintings, because they try to hold something down that must go. In sculpture, think of the, the grandmother in the Keramikos Cemetery in Athens, in her grave stele, 
a young woman. She's, this granny is probably 32. And there on her knee is a little baby. And the epitaph above it says, here I am, here's my baby. Here I sit, my much-loved child's child on my knee. In the light and in the sun, I played with you like this. And now, dead, you dead, I hold you here still. In the Keramikos, there is a huge statue of a bull. Nobody's quite sure why, but it's a big bull. And all the men go into the museum and they go to the bull, like that. And every single one of them goes... The women go straight to this grave and every single one of them weeps. It's, it's an extraordinary division there. We are trying, the, I suppose, Eliot's line in the wasteland... These fragments I have shored against my ruins. That's what I would say all art is trying to do. That's why artists are so tricky. But I think from coming from the lost rag, and every rag is lost every time it's interpreted and played and heard, it's gone. I don't think the rec recordings make much difference, so thank God for YouTube. <laughs> we start from the other end, perhaps, with the word that is then spoken out and again goes. The art is ephemeral, as the thing is ephemeral, as life is ephemeral, we have no choice. Um, two tiny things and then we'll talk more. Kipling, not a man you'd think of dealing with ephemera, not a sensitive fellow, old Kipling, though he was. His poem at the end of, after the First World War, a two-line couplet. And if they ask you why you died, tell them because your father's lied. Cuts as deep as any knife. But here is Kipling on the slow ephemera of the dog. Close to the Englishman's heart, I suppose. I have done mostly what most men do and pushed it out of my mind, but I can't forget if I wanted to, four feet trotting behind. Day after day, the whole day through, wherever my road inclined, four feet said, I'm coming with you, and trotted along behind. Now I must go by some other round, which I shall never find. Somewhere that does not carry the sound of four feet trotting behind. There's ephemera. The charge is in the ephemerality of the thing, not in the loss of the thing itself. I think that is where your rag and the poetry are more potent. They start from that point. What we are looking at is not the girl, is not the man, is not the rain, is not the flower, is not the peacock. It is the ephemerality. Last one. Most powerful instrument in music. She said she was going to bring her, what was it, Surbahar? Tambura. Tambura. <laughs> um, as I said, my first instrument I touched when I was five was um, a sitar, but um, the man who was teaching me had been made to become a doctor by his father, not a sitar player, despite winning the All India Junior competition. And um, his wife then stopped him playing it as well because she said she didn't like the noise. <laughs> the reason his father wouldn't let him be a sitarya was they were Brahmins. And they didn't do that sort of thing because it was common to be a musician. I love the Brahmin thing you always know within five minutes. Good morning, as we Brahmins say. I do. <laughs> Have you been to Bengal? No. Um, but <laughs> that's, that's why. A more powerful instrument, however, is this. A most sort of disempowering thing in, in the Western tradition is this. Mm. You can always go back to the score and say, I think you'll find that's a hemi-demi-semi-quaver. No, that's dotted. The score. There is the performance. It can't be ephemeral as long as there's this. Which is not true. 
What? Which is not true. No, it's not true, but that is what the belief. You can't... You couldn't reconstruct if all ragas were lost, you couldn't reconstruct them, whereas you could reconstruct the diatonic system merely by bowing your knee to Pythagoras, um, and Aristotle, and all the... All the, I could, who was the, who was the... Which one was it? Who did the... Um, the fractions. The fractions of those. Pythagoras. Pythagoras, yeah. Came from one horse island. But once you've got that, you can rebuild it. Starting with the ephemera, a system has been designed to promote ephemerality and the emotion, I think, that primarily comes with that. And there, I'll leave it. That is a difference between an art of loss and an art of ephemera. This was the biggest lesson on ephemera I've ever seen. Uh, anyone here know Mahler's Ninth Symphony? Very slow, and it almost exhausts itself, and this happened. Claudio Bardo conducted the audience and he conducted silence and said the most important thing in yours, in mine, in his, in any artistic tradition, which is listen. Mm. Sure do. Thank you. <laughs> How are we doing for time? Mm. How are we doing for time? Uh, 20 minutes. Okay. So... One of the things that really struck me hearing you talk about Douglas Adams um, is the idea that one of the important things about music, one of the things that we seem to be talking about here really is music being a stand-in for mortality or music being something which mm. suspends time, suspends time for the moment, um, but when it's and it's about experiencing, enjoying uh, the richness of life, and then it's over. Uh, and one of the things I think music does, uh, one of the things I, reasons I, I, I think music is important is that without being mortal, without our lives being ephemeral, uh, I don't think our lives would be as rich. I don't think music would make us feel the way it does. It couldn't. It if couldn't. we knew we were going to go on forever. I was thinking something very similar last, last night, in the middle of the night, actually, and it, and it was, well, it was it, so <laughs> I'm the girl in this. I was listening to Shahid Parvez playing um, Bhagashree in Australia. Good Lord, I mean, how can this be? <laughs> um, in Australia three years ago, how can this be? But there he was, and he, he has a trick, which I've never, uh, uh, Riyad Khan does it, Mm. to a certain extent, of just very uninflectedly repeating a simple statement. Absolutely the same, again and again. And for three or four repetitions, you think, oh, for heaven's sake. And then you begin just to see it's moving almost glacially towards a sudden sort of wild insanity. <laughs> um, but uh, Paris was doing something so extraordinary that it knocked that out of the ring. He'd play a little ton and then, with mighty force, he must have a forearm like Rod Laver, <laughs> set the thing off so that he could repeat that same ton without touching the string. Mm. His thumb was on, but his fingers were up, and he was just... It was almost inaudible. Mm. And I thought, that he's moving into an, a yet an, another way of looking at... If I'm, listen, Claudia Bardos, listen. I think that's absolutely right. Of course, in Hindu philosophy... It doesn't. Everything is sound. The cosmos is made of sound. This is a concept called Nada Brahma. Sound being divine, being God. And you have two different kinds of sound. You have an ahata sound, which is unmanifest sound. That's the sound of the universe going on all of the time. And then you have ahata sound, which is manifest sound. And that's the moment at which 
the music of the rag comes into being through uh, the performance of the musician. And then it fades back into unmanifest sound again. So in fact, it is a manifestation of cosmic sound going on all along. What do you feel, how do you feel about that idea in relation to what we've been talking about? I think it's, it's sort of, it kind of merges with ideas of the tree in the, in, in, in the forest that falls and nobody can hear it, so does it make a sound? And um, it's a sort of anthropic principle, isn't it, really? That what something does is not... It, it, it's, it's the finger up to the logical positivist. It doesn't matter. What it requires is the observer, not the phenomenon. Mm. So the whole responsibility for the universe is passed on to those who are watching it. I think it's fascinating. Um, anyone, anyone got any thoughts on that? I'd love to hear from you. No. Speak? No, you're happily content. No, I've got a... Has anybody got anything they want to ask or say at this point? Announce. <laughs> How many lost dragons do we know about that no longer exist? How many lost ragas do we know about that no longer exist? You've talked about the one yeah. rag, rag god. Many, are there hundreds? Many, many, yeah. many. So if you go back to the Sanskrit Sangeeta Shastras um, of the late Gupta period, so we're talking uh, a thousand years ago approximately, um, the raga names we have there and the shapes of the raga names we have there, some of the raga names are the same, but the shapes of the ragas, or the notations that we have for them are completely different. So they're clearly not the same things. But there's also many, many rags whose names we've, we've just no idea what's happened. So there's probably thousands of rags that have been lost. But at the same time, there's a large number of rags that have continued to come down to us through the practices of musicians over the last uh, many centuries. Um, so we are lucky to have what we do have. Um, Are there any you can reconstruct completely? Well, so... From the 18th century, yes, because we actually have some reasonably good notations for them um, in the music treatises, and Rag Gaunt probably is one that we could reconstruct. Um, it is worth remembering that it would, just, it would not be the same as listening to it then and there. That would be a, it would be uh, false to imagine that it would be the same. But, so for, for Shah Alam's songs, we have the lyrics, which of course have meter. We have the tal, the rhythmic cycle that the songs were in. We have the rag, and we know what the rag structure was because of music treatises written for him and for uh, the ruler of Lucknow at the time from the same time period. So we actually have the structure. So if anybody would like to re-sing some of Shah Alam II's songs, not as they were, but rethinking them now. Can we commission you for next Jaipur to, to come back uh, <laughs> Well, as you have already heard, and, I can't do sing, but... Um, but Jurassic <laughs> Park for <laughs> ruggers. Jurassic Park for ruggers. Actually, that'd be quite fun, mm. actually. I'd have to work with a musician, though, who could actually sing or play. Go for it. So, yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, Raga Saga. Raga Saga. Yes, the ocean of rags. So... Uh, I, w I, I wonder still about, about the... F not failure, but they're just not notating so much of it for so long. Mm. I, for a very, very highly literate and, and, and text-crazy society to say, no, we're not going to write this down. We have, yes, we have perfectly good ways of doing it, and yes, we know there are perfectly good ways of doing it. Those odd monks over in that wet little island, they've got some very sophisticated... We'll borrow them. No. It's as though there is, I, w I wonder, some kind of um, uh, sort of vouched for importance in getting your tune off the end of somebody else's zither. What is it? It's multiple things, but I do think that there is a real aesthetic here of, of seeing the transiency of the performance as, uh, as poignant. So it's kind of poignancy of transience, that this is actually what it's all about. The, but by that, that, by that, that principle, is. then, when you took a photograph to record... I remember a friend of mine whose mother was mistakenly believed she was dying, and she took her daughter to Paris and took photograph after photograph after photograph of her for three days. Mm. And the only thing we could think of was she felt that she wasn't going to be able to be there to watch over her daughter, so the photographs would do it instead. This is as if the photographs weren't fixed. You photographed something ephemeral to capture it, and then you made sure that the thing itself, the capture, was ephemeral as well. Mm -hmm. The chain of, of infinite ephemerality, is that...? There's a question. Of, yeah. Uh, Catherine. 
Thank you very much for that. Absolutely fascinating. The relationship between poetic meter and rhythmic tiles is difficult in any setting mm -hmm. of any words to music uh, in any language or any musical tradition. Could you tell us more about the relationship, particularly okay. in the tradition you're studying? Yeah. So, um, so if one is so, um, my own area of work is in fact um, Persian uh, literature and and to a lesser extent Urdu literature. Um, so the the work that I did on Ragond, I actually did with a colleague, David Lunn. Uh, who is a Hindi uh, specialist and a Braj specialist, and so he knows more about the poetry from that side of things. But from the Persian and Urdu side of things, um, the, you're right, the relationship between sung meter and, um, uh, and poetical meter is really difficult. So if you have something like another um, piece that I've been working on, I've been working on Sophia Plowden's album of courtesan songs from Lucknow, and there is one in there, or is a few in there that could be reconstructed because she wrote down in Western notation the tunes for these songs, and we have the lyrics and we have their meters. Um, and one of them is a is a, a song called um, "Sing, Sweet Voice Musician, Ever Fresh and Ever New," which is by the great poet Harpers. And if you look at it, it's in a meter of seven, so something like. However, if a ghazal singer today would set that to even a, a seven beat tile or a 14 beat tile, it would actually be sung very, very differently. But the beauty of it is, I think, that the things that matter are actually the raga, which can be performed in any way you like, uh, as long as it adheres to the rules. And then it is the raga that brings before you the spirit of the raga. Um, and the poetry, and the, the setting of, of the poetry, and using the rag to get the different kinds of emotional nuances out of the words. As long as you've got both of those two things, I think you're being faithful to um, the song setting, even if it doesn't sound like what it might have sounded like back then, if that makes any kind of sense at all. So. And it can't sound like, like it sounded back then because it their ears worked. were different. Yes. Yes, they heard things differently. Uh, do, you, do you think that the god Malhar has moved to a little more different version of uh, Malhar called the Miyaki Malhar? where, uh, you know, the use of uh, uh, B flat and B regular or uh, knee and E flat and knee is more subtle and more modified? It's a really good question. I'm just going to go back to this slightly, oh, no, other wrong way, slightly more tedious slide. Oh, it's not going to work. Not going to work. Okay, so... Ha. Huh. Okay. So, um, one of the interesting things about Ragond and Ragond Malhar in the 18th century treatises is that they are clearly separate, they are described separately, and so you'll have Ragond is like this and Ragond Malhar is like this. Um, and they were described separately from at least the 16th century onwards, so they're clearly separate rags already by the 16th century. Um, what is interesting about Gond is that the more information you get about this, the, it, its sonic uh, properties from the 18th century and 19th century treatises, the more it starts looking suspiciously like Mianki Malhar. Um, and some of these, uh, the mid 19th century treatises in Delhi, um, they're the first time in this tradition that they start talking about a rug called Mianki Malhar around about the same that Rag Gond disappears. And I have been wondering whether Mianki Malhar may actually be the name of a new name for Rag Gond that reflects its association, its clear association with the Mughal court from the time of Tan Sen and from the time of Akbar, um, but renamed perhaps in, in, in retrospect to you know, reflect a time when Indians were more powerful than the British. It's immediately after the uprising that this happens. 
Um, but what is true of RAG and people who study the way RAGs have evolved through treatises and then into the present day is that subtle variations are, happen are ongoing all of the time. Um, and um, so I think it probably doesn't completely answer your question. But uh, yeah. Sorry, say again? OK, so the, no the, the notation that they use in the treatises is they use sargam notation, so the oral solface, um, for and uh, just the syllables. Um, but they also have um, a rhythmic notation, um, and in from the 18th century onwards, it's also attached to uh, lyrics, uh, bowls, syllables um, that are sung. So you could actually, you know, sort of rewrite it in Western notation if you wanted to. But this is completely indigenous system. So we can actually recreate the shapes of the ragas as, as they were written down in these treatises. Um, uh, we can sing them. Um, and when you get into the 19th century, there are these amazing sort of teach yourself sitar handbooks, which have really detailed notation and tell you exactly the scale, where you need to set the frets of the sitar, um, exactly the, the, the bowls, the syllables of the um, hand strokes that you need to use. Um, and my lovely colleague, Alan Miner, um, at the University of Pennsylvania, who's a beautiful sitarist, has actually recreated some of these 19th century um, sitar pieces, um, which just sound amazing. The level of detail in the notation is incredible, in fact. So, yeah, it's one um, I wanted to ask, actually, it was the same question about notation. Um, mm -hmm. But also, uh, is there any evidence of um, there being more of a drive to try and no write down um, or put down the music after the introduction of like when British people came and there was evidence of the Western tra classical tradition as well? Yeah. So there's a couple of things that happen. So the treatise I've just been talking about is called the Usul and Akhmat Yasafi. And it was produced in so the roots of music for Asaf, as in Asaf Udola, the Nawab of Lucknow. And it was produced in the same environment where you have all these crazy English people running around writing down in Western notation the tunes of Nach girls and working with, um, and courtesans, and working with courtesans and Hindustani musicians and playing the harpsichord with them. And so they were clearly all aware of what each other was doing. But they're using notation that's completely indigenous to India and comes out of the Sanskrit treatises in order to write things down. But they're not so much interested in writing tunes and things down. There is another phenomenon that happens, is, which is that they start writing all their song texts down. And so we've got these huge compendia, these huge collections of song texts. And I think that's about um, the fact that all of these musicians are scattering all over India, out of Delhi, out of, out, um, out of the, the places which are you know, under attack all of the time, and going to places like Hyderabad and Kathmandu. And why do you write down your songs at this point? Why do song collections become so important? It's because you can no longer go down the road to ask Uncle Jaffer. I'm sorry, I, uh, Uncle G, I cannot remember the second line to the Antara. I just can't remember. Can you please remind me what those words are? And I think that's what's going on there. Um, yeah. Um, going back to what you were saying about the Gaunt being evolved into mm. a subsequent similar rag. Is it not possible that, in fact, oh, what one um, believes about lost ragas, that it's quite likely that what had happened was that those supposedly lost ragas had, in fact, evolved as they should. Why not? I mean, you know, traditions change, even if they don't change Absolutely. overnight. And it's quite likely that there was, in fact, a process of evolution, which should be allowed in any case. You know? Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And I think that's certainly the case for a number of ragas. So if you look at Pori, for example, the original main scale of rag Pori is what we now call Bilaskhani Tori. Mianki Tori is much later. But you can actually see through the treatises Tori morphing into the, the, the Myanki Tori that we know today, which is beautiful, actually. Um, the late, great Nazir Jaras boy used to say that the Hindustani ragas have inbuilt into them a kind of um, instability which leads itself to moving uh, and changing over the centuries as well. <coughs> but the other thing is, is that an awful lot of music has been lost for various reasons. Things go out of fashion. Um, 
people die, and especially in a situation where you have this massive upheaval in Delhi in the middle of the, of the uh, 18th century, and then, of course, the incredible devastation of the uprising and the aftermath of the uprising. If you, if you kill all the musicians and the patrons, um, or exile them, if they're exiled, because the, all the Muslims were exiled from Delhi, um, from the city of Delhi for a period after, after the uprising and punishment, um, you're going to lose all sorts of things because it's embodied, it's in the bodies of the musicians. How are we going to talk about that? Well, yeah, no, what about visualizations? Are they stable or do they also evolve? I mean, Tori with its deer and so on? Or so, yes, the vis visualization, the, this, this is where things get really complicated. The, um, so, there seems to have been an establishment of a particular set of Ragamala images, um, which became the kind of canonical ones, uh, the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, Where? Um, in North India, in, in Rajasthan, uh, but in relation to Mughal interests and patronage at the same time. Um, and it's a system called, variously, the painter's system, and then the Hanuman school, Hanuman Mutt. Um, and this then becomes kind of the standard way of depicting ragas. But there are actually a number of other different schools um, of depicting ragas, which depict ragas using completely different characters and so on. And then as things, as knowledge is lost of what the raga image is supposed to do, it's supposed to express the same emotional impact to the viewer as the sound is to the listener, but using completely different means. What happens is that knowledge of exactly how that's supposed to work gets lost, things get aestheticized, and then you get all sorts of random things which really make no sense, but are just kind of beautiful paintings, which are called Ragamala paintings, except, you know, the name of the Raga is wrong because people just have just forgotten how it works. So there's a lot of things like that going on. So.